uh, Hans Morris of Nike Partners. It is great to sit down with you again. It's always fun to sit down with you. Um, I want to start off given the fact that you've done it all within your financial services career. You've been on the boards of companies. You've worked in the trenches. Uh, you know about capital markets. You pretty much know about everything within the, the financial services sector. I want to talk to you about fintech IPOs and what's going on there or the lack thereof. But before we do that, I want to talk about the general IPO sector. Um, I am reminded of that old Milwaukee beer commercial from the 1980s. It just doesn't get any better than this. Mm -hmm. And I want to get your perspective on that. H how do you look at the IPO market circa 2019, where we've had a couple of maybe high-profile companies that underperformed, like Uber and Lyft, but at the same time, we've had a lot of great performers out of the gate? So I think it's, it is an extraordinarily good IPO market. So investors are interested in risk, so the animal spirits are alive, and there's also, I think, a very broad recognition among institutional investors that there are some excellent companies that have been formed that are doing very uh, significant things. And the issues, I think the, the reason some companies haven't performed is because there's valuation gaps. So that's, that's a different issue. Uh, but still, valuations are high. If you look across just public companies, you look at uh, you know, companies like Visa or, uh, or many of the payments companies, they're, they're trading at all-time highs and at 27, 28 PE. So those are very compelling. Uh, and um, so I, I would expect, I mean, personally, I do think there will be more um, FinTech IPOs. I think companies are getting to the mature stage uh, where it's credible for them to uh, be uh, public. And we could talk more about what are some of the reasons why you would want to go public or not go public. But I do, I do expect more IPOs in the, later this year and thereafter if the market, the market stays as strong as it is now. Well, so <clears throat> I remember when we sat down and I interviewed you towards the tail end of last year, it looked like the market was cracking and there were still talks of rate hikes in the air. But now, of course, we have talk of rate cuts, mm -hmm. notwithstanding the trade tensions and the like. It seems like the markets are shrugging that off in general. And when I look at the fact that there are a couple of dozen fintech IPOs with the size and scale to go public tomorrow, I think to myself, what are they waiting for? What's your view on, like if you were to be in the boardroom of one of these companies, what's, the, what's that debate about? So let's talk about, I think it's an important question, because you have one issue, which is just your, your preparedness for an IPO. In financial services, uh, because it's regulated, there's lots of rules, and as I often say, it's regulated for a good reason. Sure. And the, the risks are sometimes, uh, you know, they're important to capture and make sure that you have your arms around them. And the standards are different for a public company than for a private company. Because something goes wrong, your private company went wrong, you learn from that, not the end of the world. But if you have a loss of some kind that's not expected, that could have really significant consequences for a public company. So uh, I'd say the preparation, the SOX type preparation, but also creating a risk committee, creating, uh, a, a, being able to measure the amount of risk that the company has at the board level, that's a, that's a big undertaking. And I would say it probably takes two years to, to get that in shape where, where a board would say, okay, we feel confident that we can project things accurately. We know the level of risk. So that's one thing. The second thing is, I think, important for all investors uh, here. Um, is anyone here a public market investor? So one, one or two. So, so public markets, you know, the, the, the measurement systems are... Uh, you, you use you know PE and you use ROE and you use uh, you, you look at uh, growth rates and uh, and um, what the what the what the price of that growth is and so there's there's standards that public markets use and those are quite well established and there, in many cases there's there's large um, universes of companies to compare them to so in payments you know there's probably 25 public companies at, at this point and. So if you have a company which is um, not earning money right now, does not have a you know, net after-tax uh, positive net income growing at a good rate, then how are you going to explain that? Now you have to explain it saying, is the present value of an earnings stream? 
and you have to persuade investors to buy into that methodology. And I think if you go from uh, venture investors, you know, so if you're an early stage venture uh, investor like we are, there are no earnings. I mean, in many cases, there's no revenues. You're really just buying into an idea. You're taking a lot of risk that that idea is going to come together and that it's going to then generate revenues, and you're going to find a, you know, a very attractive market that you can then exploit. You get a little bit, you get into a, a later stage venture or early growth, and you're usually looking at revenues. You, you want to see you know, significant revenue ramping or very significant customer ramping of some kind. But again, you're, you're, you're trying to measure that, but you might be a long way off from positive EBITDA. And you could be even further away from, uh, from net after-tax earnings. So when you're looking at private companies, you have a, you know, a set of inv- a VCs like you that look to long-term growth, look to things like that. But then you get to the public markets, and you're across the table from grizzled financial services public market veterans who have their core metrics. Um, Sure, they can acknowledge a great millennial story or a great platform story, but at the end of the day, they're going to rely on those core metrics. Do you think that part of the reluctance has to do with the fact that deep down some of these boards of these fintech companies that are big enough are worried about getting re-rated in the public markets like some other Yes. Recent IPO. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. And, the, and I think that one of the other facts, which many people know this already, but it's, it's worth mentioning, is that in a private financing, you only have to get one significant institution to agree to set the valuation. And there, there might be some followers after that, but one firm is typically setting that. And even if you have two or three or four term sheets that are around the same valuation, you're still not, you don't need every investor to agree. When you go public, you need hundreds of investors to agree with that methodology. So that's how the price is set. And, uh, and that, that might be less credible to hundreds of investors. One person or a few people might believe in it, but if you're saying, no, we're going to get everyone to agree with that, that's a tougher... Right, so they can set the terms. Yeah. Um, the other thing which I think is important to mention is, because this is a, a big issue that we focus on, and I would say that many early stage investors don't pay that much attention to it, which is how much capital do you need to, uh, to generate the revenue implicit in that business? So for example, if, you are, if you're just a software business and you're a SaaS software business, you don't need a lot of capital. You might need some operational risk capital in case something goes wrong. Uh, you don't want to go bankrupt. Uh, you, might, you certainly need capital to offset operating losses if you're growing. But generally, if you're at scale, you don't need a lot of capital, and that's why you can, in many cases, value those at very high levels. If you're, a, um, if you're warehousing risk, so if you're an insurance company or you're a lender or you're, doing, you're taking market risk of some kind, you have risk. And each dollar of revenue requires capital to support that risk. And the problem is, is if, that, if your ROE, let's say, uh, even if you're you have, you're a terrific company, you have a 30% ROE, which would be a very high ROE in the public markets. If you're trying to grow at 50%, then your capital generation rate is inadequate to fund your growth, and so therefore you're going to have to dilute yourself or lever yourself further. And, uh, and so public market investors focus on that a lot. And, and you, you look at saying, okay, you know, what's the relationship between price-to-book value of your capital and your ROE? That's a core relationship that public market investors look at, and I would say... Private market investors pay no attention to it. And that, to me, is a dangerous thing, because you're going to get to the fact when, it, when you start confronting public market investors, there could be big valuation <clears throat> gaps based upon that difference. And you mostly participate in earlier stage deals, right? Cs, As, and Bs, mm-hmm. that kind of thing, right? Um, do you ever find yourself saying, OK, I got the thesis right. I loved what my portfolio company has done thus far. But I wish there was more of an institutionalized platform for VCs like me to ultimately get liquidity before the IPO or an M&A. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I think uh, one thing we hear from our investors is that the timeline to liquidity is extended out. Companies are staying private longer, partly because there's more capital. And uh, partly because it's, um, you know, the companies are seeking to continue to 
invest, and, and, and that's linked to the capital availability, so it's seeking to continue to grow. But you know, being an investor for nine, 10 years, that's a long time, and that's almost double what it was uh, you know, a generation ago, like 10, 15 years ago, for successful companies. So if you went back to like the early 2000s or something, you said, this is a great company, and it's killing it, and it's up to, you know, it's got 70 million in revenue, and it's got you know, core profitability. Uh, that can go public, uh, but in many cases now, they're staying private longer. So yeah, I think if we had the opportunity to sell a portion of our stake in late stage at what we thought were fair valuations, that's something we would consider. You can do that, but you can't do it on, ex you know, right. there's limited, limited ability to do it on exchange, uh, and some, you know, there's signaling issues, so it's not, I, we're not doing that very much, we haven't done it yet at all, but, um, but I think that is something that would be good. Okay, so before we get into the overrated, underrated, which I'm looking forward to, I just yeah. want to ask you one more question. I would argue that a big reason why companies don't go public now is because of the short-termism that is pretty much the standard for most companies on Wall Street, right? You can't think as long-term as you used to be able to. Mm -hmm. um, enter the long-term stock exchange. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on that? Well, I think that the short-termism is, is a fact. Everyone would, I think everyone would agree with that. Uh, and even when investors, I remember when, when Visa went public and I, was, uh, I headed one of the two road shows and I remember virtually every investor we met with, all of them said, we're long-term holders. We make a long-term commitment. And I remember uh, about a year later, almost all of our top 10 holders had sold. <laughs> and so, in the, the, those that got the allocation. So that was pretty, Surprising to me because when I was when I was a banker and I was doing lots of IPOs, you we would make allocations and you would get Capital Group or T Row or some of these people would would actually hold for long periods of time. But I think all of them, all portfolio managers, are short term are, are traders in effect. Uh, and so some people might disagree with that, but that's certainly uh, my assessment. And then the um, and so. There is, I think, value to the idea that you, could you create an exchange or a mechanism which would somehow reward investors for, uh, for investing for a longer term? And would that be helpful to companies? And I, I think the ideas are, are good. I think the reality, and this is, this is um, also formed from personal experience, is that listing, you can have 100 ideas for a better market structure. But listing is highly brand related, and people make those decisions based upon brand perceptions. So when you're going public, which is a once in a lifetime experience for most people, uh, you don't want to mess around with experiments. And until someone has really proven that that exchange delivers those values, I think it's going to be a very difficult decision for boards to make. I think in most cases, they're going to go with um, with the traditional, they'll hear they'll hear the pitch, but at the end of the day, you don't get fired for listing on the the Nasdaq or the NYSE. Yeah, and actually, I worked I actually worked on the privatization of Nasdaq in the late '90s, and uh, so I was very familiar. I am very familiar, but at that point, was extremely familiar with market structure. And 2008, we're getting ready to uh, do the IPO visa, and we had um, we had presentations from Nasdaq and and the New, the New York Stock Exchange, and uh, and I thought NASDAQ made a very persuasive presentation. And to me, if you're a large market cap company, the liquidity differences between the two exchanges are immaterial. There is no difference. And so my view is like, okay, I would recommend let's go with NASDAQ. And, and, and our CEO said, I could take, he didn't agree with me, but he said we could discuss it with the board. So we went to the board, I talked about it, and 100% unanimous board, no interest in listening to NASDAQ. All of them wanted New York Stock Exchange and, and because of the prestige. And I thought that was a pretty good, now maybe that's out of date because that's, that was 11 years ago, but I'd still say that's, I, I think most boards are pretty risk averse when they're making those decisions. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, the overrated, underrated feature. Yeah. Um, I guess it would be sort of the equivalent of the strong buy or the strong sell, if you okay. will. Um, I'm just going to read these off to you. Um, Brian Moynihan. So I think he's underrated. I, I think Brian is, a, is an excellent manager and has a good strategic view 
of technology and impact. And I know a lot of people here won't agree with that, and people were criticizing Bank of America. I think he's done an excellent job, and I think he's a, uh, he's not, you know, he's not charismatic like some other uh, CEOs are, but he's a really good operator, and he's made a lot of progress since he's been CEO. Leapfrogging in the financial services world, particularly in the emerging markets. So I think that's also, I think that's a big deal. And I thought there were some, some great presentations even here. But what, obviously, I think everyone's familiar with China. Uh, but the changes in India um, just in the last couple of years uh, have been significant in terms of like, several hundred million people are using electronic uh, payments. And that, you know, I think we'll see many changes both in credit and payments and even products which really aren't offered in most of the EM, like insurance. If you can, you know, deliver cheap type of, of uh, like crop insurance and other things, it's, uh, I think that's actually quite persuasive. And the, the smartphone penetration, I think it's, this statistic might not be right, but I think it's like 70, over 70% of Nigerians have a smartphone. So it's, it's, wow. it's, it's, it's going to markets where you wouldn't have expected suddenly you have internet access and it's uh, obviously, it's already moving quickly, but I think there will be major further changes in financial services in those markets. Speaking of emerging markets, the um, very buzzy, much talked about Facebook crypto project Libra. I'd say I would probably go along that one too. Uh, and, and, and the reason is, is that, and I think that the issue, if, if Facebook weren't in the middle, the front page today, uh, you know, the Mark Zuckerberg saw some bad emails or sent some bad emails is an example, which is to pull something like that off, you need incredible trust to shape that ecosystem. And I think the design that, they're, that, they're, that they proposed is very well thought through. I, I, very impressed by it, and I think that it is, um, and so their principles are good, the details from what I learned are also really good, and they might be able to pull it off. And, and the example I like pointing to is, is uh, with Apple and Apple Pay. So a lot of people may not know this, but you know, Apple Pay was the first instance where they got all three networks initially to agree to tokenization, and card, not pre card present um, interchange and liability for a mobile transactions. First instance ever. So people have been talking, networks have been talking about that for a decade, tokenization and card, card not present rules. But Apple had the ability to shake the whole ecosystem, get all the other banks to agree, get MasterCard, Visa, Amex to agree. That was, that's because they were Apple. Facebook, I think, has similar credibility as technologists, but also identity management, which is a big part of, of uh, you know, concerns of regulators around the world for a good reason, which is you don't want illicit use of a payment system. And so they have, I think, some unique credentials plus credibility to pull it off. The credibility part, because of this trust, suddenly their trust, <laughs> trust rating's gone down a lot, that might make it not workable. But um, so I'd say I'd probably be a buyer. It's pretty speculative, but I'd probably be underrated on that, too. <clears throat> and what's your view of the value proposition of the node? I think it's to be determined, but I think the way they've designed it is good. So I'd probably I'd be a buyer of a node. OK. Strong buy on the node. OK. Um, all right, open banking. So this is a, uh, I think, one of the big trends is this uh, banking as a service that infrastructure that you can rent and making it more accessible and reducing complexity of delivery and, uh, and cost. That was one of the presentations uh, yesterday. I thought that was, I agree with that. And I think that the, the valuations on some of the companies, again, most of the companies, if you're going to be full stack banking, it depends on what you're doing. If you're just a wrapper and you're going to get access to it and your software, that's I'm very positive on that. If you say no, we're going to be, we're going to take advantage of, of that fluidity and change, willingness to people to change bank accounts, so that we're going to be a bank and be a full stack, one of these neo banks. I'm skeptical. Now we've been I've been wrong on that, but uh, because I think what I was saying before about the amount of risk, the amount of capital is necessary. And it's still hard to get people to move core transaction accounts. Well, you've been right on a lot of things, too. Yeah, I've been wrong on that so far. Thank you so much. Our All right. Thanks, next everybody. moderator is Ana Herrera of Reuters.